So, so today we're going to be talking about environmental allergies. Um, this is, uh, I, I realized that, that I, I should have written in the, the, the description allergies because there's, you know, really we want to separate food allergies and environmental allergies, partially because they're very different in terms of how we treat them and partially because they're very different in terms of even, you know, how they develop and, and you know, what we're really looking at and, and you know, especially, especially related to, you know, treatment, both the treatments that we give, but also the, the what you need to do when you have a food allergy versus what you need to do when you have an environmental allergy. Um, so um, so really what's the, the kind of, I wanna start with sort of describing what's happening with your immune system when you have allergies and then sort of work through why some of the treatments that we use work, um, but then also talk through some conventional treatments as well. Um, there some of the things I didn't put on here that, that we'll talk about are also ways to modify your environmental exposure to allergies. Um, and, uh, and, and so we're also kind of gonna work through that as well. So, so how allergies work, um, your immune system has a, a few different types of responses to, to different proteins that are new. So, so your immune system is really good at, at seeing proteins and identifying, you know, if you really think about it, it's pretty wild that, you know, you think about all the bacteria and all of the foods and all of the spices and everything that you eat and that your body can see one protein and say, oh, that's an infection um, and identify it as an infection. Um, and so what happens when we have allergies is that the body is misidentifying that, that protein. So it's, it's thinking that it's an infection, but it's actually uh, just something that's normally occurring in the environment. So, um, so there's two big kind of categories of, of immune reactions that, that we can have to infection. One is the one that we usually have to bacteria and viruses, which is where there's an immune cell that, that sort of eats the, the bacteria and virus, right? So it's because it's small, it sort of, it phagocytoses it, which it basically means that it sort of surrounds it and then it breaks it down. Um, and so that's more of an IgG reaction, which is also known um, as a delayed hypersensitivity reaction. That's more often what, what people are talking about when they're talking about food allergies, um, but we'll come back to that in the food allergy class. Um, when we're looking at, at environmental allergies, so specifically the set of symptoms that's, that's um, congestion, hives, um, you know, what we think of as an allergic reaction, something that's very like immediate, um, the, you know, sometimes people get migraines, sometimes people get itchy eyes, um, the, uh, sometimes some swelling, um, but very often when we're talking about environmental allergies, we're talking about hay fever, which is really that, you know, itchy throat, congested nose, itchy eyes. Um, so, um, and what happens with that is that you, you're getting the immune system reaction. It's actually similar to the immune system reaction, or not similar, it is the immune system reaction that's really uh, most effective for fighting um, uh, parasites. So parasites are large enough that the immune cells can't eat them up in that same way. So what they do is they actually, there's a little mast cell, that little eosinophil that, um, which is a type of white blood cell that has its little contents, which include the histamine, which is kind of the one we know the best, but also a lot of other markers that, that trigger inflammation. And it actually, if the, if, the, if the protein is here, it actually spits its contents at that. So because it knows it can't really eat it, so it just sort of spits this, these contents. And what happens is those contents then end up in circulation in our body. And that's why often people who have seasonal allergies will feel more tired, sometimes a little bit depressed, um, even when their, their allergy symptoms are well managed. So say they're taking a loratadine and they're not getting as much congestion, but, but very often, especially around this time of year, I see people who are just kind of dragging. And, and really what, what we know is that those other inflammatory markers that are inside those cells that, that sort of spit themselves, um, are, are contribute to those feelings of, of fatigue and kind of that foggy headedness. And sometimes like people talk about like a heavy head feeling. Um, so, so really what's happening is, is that we're having a, we're, we're, our, our body, our immune system is identifying those proteins that are, might be in pollen or might be in dog dander or might be in, um, you know, elm tree um, or mold, identifying them as if they were a parasite and, and re responding that way. So, so there's a lot of different theories about why this is. So, so the definitely allergies have been on the rise, particularly one of the things that people are looking at quite a bit is how many more children now have, um, have food, really severe food allergies. Um, and also I will say even in my 10 years of practice that, that the, the rate of allergies, environmental allergies uh, has increased significantly. Um, so there's a lot of different theories out there. I'll kind of run through them. None of them are really, you know, 
have been studied or they're all very difficult to study um, because we're talking about population-based um, issues and there's so many factors, right? So you can look at the same population and say, oh, wow, you know, in this one group, there's you know more more children with with severe anaphylaxis, which is like a very strong allergic reaction that kind of can die from. Or you can look at you know this population and say, wow, there's more allergies, but there's so many factors that it's very difficult to study. You know, one being like, are people going to the doctor for that? Um, also, um, you know, so a lot of people don't, don't go to the doctor for allergies, so we can't really track it very well in terms of incidence. Um, but then also, um, you know. Is it does it have to do with food? Does it have to do with you know something else about the environment? Does it have to do with mold levels or cockroaches? Actually, cockroaches are a major source of allergens for people, um, and so in areas where there's more cockroaches, they, we do see more um, allergic responses sometimes. So there's so many factors that we can't really say that any of these theories are true, but I think that they all kind of carry their own weight and they all give us something to think about in terms of how we how we go about. You know, treating and preventing allergies. Um, so one, the one that I sort of think about the most is is kind of a two part one, which is that our food is cleaner than it ever has been in terms of having less bacteria on it, um, and and our bodies really depend on that good bacteria, and that good bacteria actually really signal to us a tolerance reaction. So um, they 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 make the immune system more likely to tag a protein as a as not a threat um, when when there's when there's good bacteria around. The other thing that's a really pretty fascinating concept, and, and this one is something that people talk about in the realm of autoimmunity as well, which autoimmunity is when the immune system attacks your own body tissues, is that we don't have enough parasites, which is like funny to say that, right? Like, like don't have enough parasites, but um, but really, uh, you know, human throughout human history, there's you know generally people have had parasites, um, and and so the idea behind that theory is that. That this this part of the immune system, this this eosinophilic response, that this the, the cells that spit this stuff, that those are called the eosinophils, um, that they were really engaged with fighting parasites, or not fighting, but sort of dealing with parasitic infections, right? So if you had a low grade response to a parasite for a long time, then you wouldn't um, then that those eos you wouldn't have really those eosinophils to go be you know re reacting to to pollen per se. Um, so, um, so it's an interesting concept, you know, it's really, um, you know, when I think about the immune system and how, you know, it's, it's really um, adapted to, to all of the environmental sort of, um, uh, uh, you know, bacteria and everything that we encounter. Um, and if it was, you know, that for so many generations that we've generally had parasites, it makes sense to me that now there's this part of the immune system that, that is is responding in a different way to the environment than than it did be in the past. Um, so that that one really makes sense to me. Um, partially, the other reason I, I think about it is because um, I, I've been um, reading articles about. Um, there's specifically a colleague of mine has done a lot of work with um, like fecal transplant, but he also does he also works with helminthic therapy, and the results that he's getting in terms of working with people with autoimmune conditions and, and actually sorry. infecting them. Sorry, my watch. Um, that actually infecting them with a parasite is are incredible, like like unheard of results uh, in terms of treating autoimmunity. Um, so who would think, right, that we'd actually be intentionally infecting people with, with parasites in order to treat a disease, but um, but there it is. So anyway, for that reason, as well as, you know, both because the theory makes sense to me, but also because I'm seeing those responses, I, I really wonder about that a little bit. Um, so some other other things that are out there are that um, you know that that specifically it has to do with the GI tract. So whether or not the the fact that you know we don't we don't have as many good bacteria, but also that the foods that we have that are more sort of more refined carbohydrates and more simple carbohydrates make our GI tract. We'll talk about this more in the food allergy section, but make our GI tract more permeable so that those proteins can pass over more easily, which then makes our immune system sort of respond differently to them. I, I always think about it being like. Like weeds, you know, basically, if, if if the intestinal tract is more permeable and these proteins end up in places where they're not just not supposed to be, then the immune system gets used to pulling them um, because really those proteins should get broken down before they're they're absorbed. But if we have that kind of permeability issue, then then they're kind of ending up in the area where the blood is before before they really are broken down sufficiently. So um, so those are just kind of the the top top ones about allergies. The other thing that, that I'll just sort of throw in there is that there might be a nutritional component here. 
Um, so one thing there is, there are some studies about people being more prone to allergies when they have magnesium deficiency. And I will say one of the magnesium deficiency is one of the most widespread deficiencies that I see in practice. Um, what, what a magnesium deficiency often looks like is, um, is uh, sometimes people feeling anxious, sometimes uh, muscle twitches, um, often craving for chocolate because your body is incredibly wise and it knows that chocolate is a very good source of magnesium. Um, and uh, um, um, I already said the muscle twitches and everything and sometimes muscle spasms or muscle tightness. Um, so, and sometimes difficulty sleeping as well. Um, so, so really, you know, that, that nutritional component, but also the other nutritional component that we're gonna talk about a lot today is really about these, um, these uh, bioflavonoids and um, these components in vegetables that are really good at stabilizing these mast cells so that they're not so reactive. Um, so really thinking about when we talk about quercetin and vitamin C, but also just kind of bioflavonoids in general, which are sort of like that a big overarching sort of class of, of that that quercetin and vitamin C fall into that the um, that those all really help to prevent allergic reactions. And you know, and really when I look at you know people and what we're eating and you know what what's um, sort of like the the normal uh, dietary intake um, in this country, you know, clearly there's there's far fewer vegetables um, and even whole grains. Um, so, so I definitely think about that. That's not one I see out there very much in terms of a theory about allergies, but um, but it's definitely for sure something that's that's always at play with basically anything we think about uh, in terms of health is is really nutrition. So, any questions about that or about kind of what what's out there in terms of why allergies happen? No. Okay. So, um, so then we're going to talk through kind of some natural medicine treatments that we use. Um, so, and then also kind of food sources of those. So, so a lot of times, you know, to be totally like upfront, a lot of times in practice, I'm actually using a formula that is in a capsule form, um, partially because to get enough of these nutrients, a lot of times we need to have a, um, a capsule form. So usually by the time people are coming in to me as, as a doctor saying, hey, I have allergies, their allergies are usually pretty severe. So, so we kind of have to use like a little bit higher doses of these things. But when people, you know, um, sort of when I think about people with very mild allergies, um, these are things we can do through food, um, you know, and, and especially if we're doing it kind of like preemptively. So, so even if people start doing this, you know, in this kind of early, early April time, early, you know, March, April time before the pollen is really kicking, um, a lot of times that can, can help prevent that, those allergies from really coming on. So that's why we're doing this in April. Um, so quercetin is, um, it's a really strong antioxidant, but it's also a, it also is really uh, potent in terms of stabilizing the mast cells and the eosinophil. So those are the two cells that I was talking about that are part of that allergic reaction. Um, oh, am I not talking loud enough? I'll do a little bit louder. <laughs> yeah. oh. You cut out for a minute. That's all. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay, so the uh, um, so it's uh, quercetin is a really good antioxidant, but it also stabilizes those mast cells, which are the ones and the and the eosinophils that are part of that reaction of like that where they spit the uh, the histamines and other other components. Um, so um, and and by stabilizing those, I mean that it makes them less less responsive, so they're less likely to to have that kind of response. Um, or if there is that kind of a response, it won't be as robust of a reaction. Um, so the foods that are really high in quercetin, onions are really the highest. Um, so in red and onion, yellow onions are the best. And the more, there's, there's more quercetin, basically quercetin is almost always in the peels of things. Um, so, so the closer you get to the onion peel, some people even take the onion peel itself and they um, uh, you know, boil it or, or um, you know, keep it as part of the stock when they're making soup to get a little extra quercetin. Um, I actually don't know. I know that that's a practice. I actually don't know if, how much quercetin people get from doing that, whether you have to eat the onion or whether you can boil it, but, but it's a practice that's been around for a long time. And, um, uh, so, um, and then citrus fruits. Um, so and that, what that means is not necessarily drinking orange juice, but, but, you know, eating, eating the, the citrus fruit, you know, particularly the quercetin is in the, in the sort of connective parts of the, of the, of the citrus fruit. So the, the, the white parts basically. Um, and then um, blueberries. So you'll, you'll see blueberries. They're going to pretty much show up everywhere because they're amazing. Um, but the, there's quite a bit of, blue, of quercetin in the, the, um, 
uh, the outside of the, the blueberry. Um, also, they're really high in vitamin C and also uh, bioflavonoids. And so all three of those things are really going to be helpful in terms of preventing allergies. So in the sense of trying to get more um, skin to inside ratio for the blueberries, using the wild blueberries is a great way to get a little bit more blueberry skin for, for, for how much you're eating the blueberries. Um, cherries, tomatoes, um, especially the smaller tomatoes, because you're getting, again, you want more skin, um, more of the, uh, the, the tomato skin. And then whole apples, and same thing, it's, it's really in the skin. So if you're not eating the skin, you're probably not getting a whole lot of quercetin. Um, so, um, and, then, and then vitamin C is another one. So vitamin C has been shown to decrease histamine levels. Um, so a lot of the research that we have on vitamin C really is um, about intravenous vitamin C. There is, there is a smaller body of research about oral vitamin C um, and, and, and that shows positive results. What I really think about vitamin C is that it, <laughs> excuse me, <laughs> we're demonstrating seasonal allergies over here. <laughs> um, the, uh, what, I, what I really think about it is that it um, uh, um, doesn't hurt. And also clinically I've seen it, especially with children, I use a lot of vitamin C just because it's kind of the most gentle and easiest to get into applesauce and get them to eat it. Um, and I've seen it work really, really quite well. Um, so the, um, um, the foods that we want to think about, of course, citrus fruits, you know, people are always surprised that citrus fruits don't actually have the most vitamin C. I think that was like a marketing thing of the citrus fruits. <laughs> um, uh, they're, they, they're not the highest in vitamin C. Um, kale actually has quite a bit of vitamin C in it. Um, rose hips. So if you ever have gone, you can, you can, um, you know, wild, like definitely look it up. So you make sure you're, you're craft, you're getting the right thing, but you can make like rose hip jam, rose hip tea. Um, that's the really, they're really high in, in vitamin C. Um, kiwis and papaya is great because it also has proteases. And what a protease means is it's something that breaks down proteins. And so specifically, you know, those, those proteases can help break down the proteins, but also that you're ingesting, but also the proteins that, um, like, like histamine itself. Um, another, another sort of thing that we use in terms of proteases is, is, um, bromelain, which is from highest in pineapples. And, um, and that's something, um, there's not a huge body of research about it, but, it, but again, it's one of those things that like, um, you know, it's been used for many generations, um, to help decrease histamine levels. Um, and, and it really does, you know, break down some histamine levels, it seems like. Um, but, but again, we just don't have the kind of, you know, significant research that, that makes me be able to say like, definitely this, this works, but, um, but if you, the, the formula that I use quite often, um, does contain some of the bromelain as well as the quercetin, as well as nettles, um, and also something called NAC, which is a, is a, thins the mucus so that you don't get that like really congestion, that sinus congestion that often can turn bacterial. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so, so bromelain is in there. I do think it's, it's worthwhile. And also we don't have a whole lot of studies to back that up. Um, and then probiotics are something that, especially in children, I tend to use them because of the way that we know that they, they support this, this tolerance reaction of the immune system. Um, again, the research is really mixed on that. And I think that that's partially because they're, you know, the quality of probiotics can vary wildly. And also they're using, they're trying different strains and there's certain ones. So there's certain studies that come out with positive effects of probiotics on, on, on um, allergies and other ones that come out with it being either equivocal or negative, you know, no, no change compared to placebo. Um, and again, probiotics, there's so many benefits to them that it's not going to hurt to, to add them to the mix. Um, and, and they may help with, with allergies as well. Um, so probiotics, you know, getting from fermented foods, um, uh, sauerkraut is a wonderful way to get them because also you get that glutamine that we talked about with, uh, with cabbage and, um, that helps to prevent that intestinal permeability. Um, yogurt, I just want to put a little thing in here for water kefir or some people say kefir, some people say kefir. I actually never really know which one it's supposed to be, but um, uh, that is a really great way if you if you avoid dairy, um, a really great way to get some extra probiotics. You get these little um, uh, cultures, these little um, little uh, things that you can actually get at Fiddleheads or any, any um, health food store, and um, and you actually just you add a little bit of, of juice or and a little bit of a sweetener, and that those create more probiotics for you, and so then it's just a lovely drink. Um, that doesn't have the same kind of, you know, doesn't have caffeine like kombucha does, and it doesn't have uh, dairy if, if, if for people who avoid dairy. Um, and of course, you can get probiotics from probiotic capsules. Um, 
And um, so, so also, um, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, I, I always, I get worried about when I talk through all of these different things, I don't want people to feel overwhelmed about, you know, just like, oh my goodness, I'm supposed to do this and this and this and this, and, you know, have this whole list of things. I think that, you know, really when I, when it comes down to it, the more eating fruits and vegetables is, is like kind of the cornerstone of a person's diet, the more they're getting all of these benefits. So, so really it's not so much like needing to focus in on any one specific thing. I mean, I think really if you're, if you're looking at like food medicinally, like what, you know, what would be the food to go to? Um, I think I would actually probably go with blueberries and that's the one that I prescribe the most, um, partially because I find that they're easy to kind of work into the, the food for the day. Um, you know, so the, so about, you know, a quarter cup of blueberries, um, but partially because not only are you getting these benefits related to allergies, but also that really high ORAC value so that antioxidants and also the blood sugar and, and the blood pressure, you know, uh, response for blueberries, they're just all around pretty wonderful. Um, so nettles, I think of any herb that I want to think about for allergies, we use a lot of different ones for, you know, some for allergic asthma, some for helping to clear the sinuses, but nettles really kind of cover the bases. Um, and that's partially because you can see here that, that on this um, second page of the handout, that they have multiple mechanisms of action, which basically when we say mechanisms of action means what is it doing in the body that makes it have this effect of reducing allergies? Um, so it actually hits all of the points, right? So, so they, it makes those mast cells and the eosinophils a lot less likely to react. So it stabilizes them, makes them you know, a lot like what we talked about with quercetin. Um, it blocks the histamine receptors. So, so that's what medications do is they go and they block the, the histamine receptors. Um, and, and that, that, you know, is, so it's, it has a little bit of that activity. And then it also reduces the pro-inflammatory enzymes. So, that those are, you know, this, these, these pathways that get triggered that create an inflammatory response. Um, so when I was talking about that kind of fatigue and that just sort of uh, brain fog kind of feeling that people get with allergies, um, that helps to reduce those pro-inflammatory enzymes, which, which promote that, those, those types of symptoms. Um, the, uh, um, also nettles actually contain quite a bit of, of nutrients. Um, and uh, you know a lot of good minerals and everything like that. I, um, you know, kind of in herbal medicine, they're very much spring medicine. So even if a person doesn't have allergies, they're really, really just nutritive and wonderful in that kind of sense of being coming out of winter and really, you know, getting getting those nutrients, um, those minerals that we need to to move into spring and summer. Um, so really, two to three cups of nettle tea is the therapeutic dose there. Um, and, and I've seen that alone reduce allergic symptoms really effectively. And, and, um, and, and a lot of people, I often will say, you know, go ahead and put local honey in there, partially because so many people, you know, the, anecdotally, I hear people talking about local honey all the time. And, um, and I've, you know, and, and, you know, that's in terms of even like when I go to conferences and other, other providers talking about, you know, it's, it's very clear that there's something there. However, I will say the research didn't really back that up all that well. Um, there's, there's kind of some, some research that says maybe honey is helpful, especially local honey, but, but really actually a lot of it didn't really come out with a positive finding, um, in terms of the honey. Um, so, uh, it makes sense that the local honey would help. Um, and that's, you know, sort of from a mechanism perspective, because what happens is when the bees are carrying the pollen, that pollen, those pollen, um, proteins are sort of, you know, present, uh, you know, in the whole process. And so it's almost like honey can be, we'll talk about immunotherapy, it can be sort of like these low level um, exposures to those proteins in a way that that might, you know, support a tolerance reaction. So, so kind of from a mechanism perspective, it makes sense. And also, um, you know, basically I can't say like, oh yeah, honey definitely does it. But I also don't think it's gonna hurt to have a little bit of that with your nettle tea. Um, and, and again, you know, like sometimes that, that people get into a rhythm with the nettle tea and they just make a big batch and then they drink it all day. And that's great. Um, and also sometimes people just do better taking it as a capsule because it's hard to continue doing that, um, you know, as, as part of a, the daily routine. Um, any questions about those things? Oh, yeah, go ahead. I just want to say something about grapefruit juice. <laughs> ah, yeah, go for it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I had not had it for years because initially it was I was on a statin, couldn't have it. And then, of course, it's bad for you, your diet, mm -hmm. higher sugar, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, I tried to start giving blood recently, and um, I was turned down. My hemoglobin was too low. Mm -hmm. And the nurse said to me that you need uh, vitamin C, you need and citrus so that you can get the iron at, uh, mm -hmm. into your blood right. Mm -hmm. And... Um, so I was determined to, next time to give blood without having the hemoglobin problem. So I reintroduced, um, and she had she was a grapefruit juice lover. <laughs> anyway, so I reintroduced four ounces of grapefruit juice every morning, and um, kicked up the uh, spinach mm -hmm. the diet. And uh, next time went through uh, wonderful hemoglobin results. Awesome. Um, just a few weeks later, Great. So, you know, e eating, I can get that you get more from actually eating the fruit, mm -hmm. but I, I think like, I don't know, four ounces mm -hmm. can be helpful. <laughs> Yep, yep. And and actually by the same mechanism that, that grapefruit juice is, it can interact with medications. It's actually really good for you in the sense that it supports those liver pathways. Um, and so it does, you know, like that can get you, cause problems with the medication and it's basically causing you to metabolize that medication too quickly. Um, but it's, but it's great for your liver. It's great for the vitamin C content. Um, yeah, and, and what's nice about grapefruit juice is that often that four ounces is like plenty. You know, people, I noticed with, with orange juice, they tend to drink a little bit more of the orange juice um, because it's like sweet and it's like, you know, you want it, you know, but that, that strong sour flavor. And then also, even from a Chinese medicine perspective, actually getting that sour in the morning is really good for you. So um, we're going to have uh, um, Leilani Wang is going to come talk to us about, about, uh, about a lot of different things related to that. And um, uh, but that sour flavor is actually really, from a Chinese medicine perspective, really good for you in the morning. So, and four ounces of juice is totally a, a fine quantity of juice. And also that, you know, really that, you know, supporting your, your body and absorbing the iron, especially because spinach iron is actually a harder iron to, to absorb. Um, and so that combination is a super combination of the uh, grapefruit juice and the spinach. Um, so all of the plant-based irons are a little bit harder to absorb because they're not in a heme form, which is the, the form that, that, you know, we kind of can use the best and we can, um, and, and so, so for your body to actually get the iron from plants, it, it takes a little bit more effort. And so, so you did the trick, you were like, you made it, made it happen in terms of that, combining that with the, the grapefruit juice. Um, it's really wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you inspired me last week with the blueberries. Right. And um, I was able to find organic, but then I said, so suppose I can't find organic. And then I said the wild blueberries. So I called Wyman. I am and, and I've been playing telephone tag with the lady at Wyman because I want to find out how many pesticides and herbicides they use in their wild blueberries. So we've just been leaving messages back and forth. So once I hear back from her, I will report in and let you know what Wyman is doing in regards to pesticides and herbicides on their wild blueberries. Wonderful. Oh, thank you for doing that, that recon and, and coming back with the information, because that is something that I actually um, have kind of meant to do for a long time, because I, I, I've heard, you know, in certain conferences and things like that, you know, I hear that, like, they don't really have to use pesticides on the wild blueberries and that, um, but, but it's so much more better, you know, obviously so much better to really, really verify that. Yeah. Um, so thank you for doing that. That's like one of those things on my, on my long list of like, of like when I get to it kind of things. And uh, so, yeah, yeah. That's awesome. I, I could be your minion. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> I'm the <laughs> luckiest. <laughs> what, what is it about the skin? I, I've heard you say a couple of times about the skins and the wild blueberries that make that them better. What, what is that? Is, is, is it thicker? Right. So the skin, well, it's actually what it is, is it's the ratio. So if you eat a cup of, quarter cup of regular blueberries and, or and you put it next to a quarter cup of the wild blueberries, you can think about how, you know, the surface area of the wild blueberries relative to, you know, what, what you're eating in terms of the quarter, the quarter cup is going to be a lot. There's actually more skin involved because, because they're so tiny. And so they have the, the skin all right around them. Oh, uh, I get it. I get it. Okay. Yeah. More skin, less pulp. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Got yep. It, it is it. where a lot of the good stuff is. So that's why 
that's why they're they're good that way um oh yeah. okay all right well yeah. hopefully hopefully i'll have an answer soon on the blueberries thanks oh, i can't wait to hear about that thank I you for, like i really like literally that's one of those questions that like has been you know with me for a lot of years <laughs> so yeah. like, really, and, uh, you've yeah. also inspired me like i'm eating i'm eating more vegetables i mean our diet was pretty good but i'm eating because because all these talks, what I keep hearing, you know, what I, you know, the, the biggest takeaway that I'm walking away with is vegetables, 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 eat more vegetables. And that's like, yeah, eat more vegetables. So yeah, I've been just eating vegetables just as a meal, you know, just eat vegetables. And like, wow, it's like, I guess I haven't really been eating as many vegetables as I should be eating. Yeah. Right. So, it's kind of like, once you start doing it being like, wow, I always thought I ate a lot of vegetables. But yep. Really, and um, the uh, you know, really like what some some people talk about how like you know, really vegetables should be everything, and everything else is a condiment. You know, the vegetables should be the, the cornerstone of your food intake, and then everything else is a condiment, including grains, including you know, meats, including you know, anything else is really just like a topping for the vegetables. Yeah, like, like <laughs> the uh, yeah, the, the vegetables should be the main event instead yeah, of yeah, yeah. sides. You know, they consider them sides, really. Yeah. In yeah. our culture, right? When you go to a restaurant, what do you see? Sides and those yep. are the vegetables. Totally, right? Yeah. And it's usually like, you know, covered in like butter and all the things. And it's like, no, you know, it, yeah, it's really, is, it's like the little, little side and we got it all, yeah. it's all backwards. <laughs> yep. <laughs> what was that? There's that Michael Pollan quote that I love, um, uh, you know, how basically like the description of a healthy diet, uh, real food, mostly plants, not too much. Um, I think I'm, I might've messed that up, but, but that's the basic, you know, general direction of it. Um, and it's really, yeah, that, that I find how many people, when they start eating more vegetables, so many things get better for them. And that's everything from blood pressure and, you know, blood sugar to just sort of how they feel digestively, bowel movements and everything. Um, uh, really, you know, when, when I think about it, I think about how vegetables are the things that you know our bodies have been digesting for so many generations like no wonder we're really good at it <laughs> and, um, yeah right <laughs> exactly right and and you know grains and everything have changed so much you know in the course of humans you know cultivating them that um that they really are they're a different thing than they used to be you know especially wheat grains because of the way that they have all that extra um the extra starch in them um but here vegetables are our bodies are like Yes, yes. <laughs> I <got> this. <laughs> now, the other thing that I did that you said you buckwheat, you were talking about buckwheat. So I said, hmm, like I, I've incorporated it as a flour, like into a pancake or something like that, but I've never really eaten like the groats and, and had. A, so I found a recipe for a cooked cereal with buckwheat and it's fabulous. Isn't it? It's, it's my new breakfast. It's my new breakfast thing with blueberries. So, it's great, and it's so, it's very, it's nutritionally dense and it's so delicious. Yeah. Yeah. It is perfect. delicious. This recipe, um, you soak it overnight with coconut. I, I soak it with coconut milk and some cinnamon and vanilla. Yo, and wonderful. Oh, wonderful. Put awesome. it in a mason jar and soak it overnight and then just throw it in the pot and cook it in the morning. And, yeah. you know, the, 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 the groats are like nice and soft and they've absorbed all the coconut milk. Yeah, it's very delicious. So thank you Absolutely. for that. See, kudos. Oh, yeah, totally. Like, you know, and really what I think about a lot is that greens have been getting a bad reputation um, for a long time. And and I just really think about how grains, boiled grains, like boiled whole grains, are a totally different thing than grains when we make them into flour and we make them into, you know, all the things that people may use to make, you know, use grains to make. And, and really, there's so many wonderful grains out there to just, you know, it's a fun thing to experiment with, like, you know, like amaranth, you know, I don't know if you've ever cooked with amaranth before, but um, just trying the different ones and, and they all have a slightly different flavor and a different texture and, and different, you know, nutrients in them. Um, but really, really fun. I love, buckwheat is a great one too. Oh, uh, it really yeah. and truly is. And amaranth, I tried a long, long time ago, but uh, I think I'll revisit that one. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah. millet is another one that people often really like. It has kind of like a, they like a little bit of a fluffier texture. One thing to watch out for millet with though, I'm, swear, I'm sorry, I got, I'm getting us way off track, but the, uh, um, is that for some people, myself included, it can actually make your blood sugar drop a little bit. And which is a good thing for people with high blood sugar. So we use millet actually for people with diabetes and prediabetes, but for some people, oh. it can drop a little bit. Um, okay. I'll go back on mute. Sorry, I digressed. Oh, no, I'm so glad you shared. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. 
Yeah, and really, you know, especially like when we think about buckwheat and all the magnesium in it, that actually does tie right back into allergies. I guess that is something I didn't really cover directly, which is that this association with between low magnesium and more more um, allergic type reactions. Uh, and and so really, you know, eating foods that are high in magnesium. Um, also, the, the other thing about magnesium that's a trick is that we want to eat foods that are high in magnesium, but also we have to watch out for the things that deplete magnesium. So the biggest depleters of magnesium are simple carbohydrates and sugars. So whenever we eat a sugar, we often lose a little bit of magnesium. And for eating a lot of sugars, then we lose a lot of magnesium. There's also a mechanism of losing magnesium by through stress and through also through caffeine intake. Um, so, so that's the other thing we need to think about in terms of maintaining magnesium levels. Um, but, but eating again, vegetables, kale, whole grains, you know, you get all a lot of good magnesium through those foods. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention that's not on this handout is about, uh, you know, environmental sort of how to reduce the amount of, of allergens that are present in the environment. So I'm, I'm a big proponent of HEPA filters for people with, with allergies. So that is, um, you know, uh, you, there's a Honeywell brand is a really great brand of those. Um, I find that they just last a long time. Some of them have like um, reusable filters um, and just having that even just right next to your bed so that you have eight hours or more of, of you know, sort of cleaner air without as many allergen exposures um, just sort of lets your, gives, gives your body less time that it's sort of being exposed to those things. Um, also too, in terms of um, reducing exposures, using those dust pillows, um, the dust pillow covers, excuse me, um, they actually help so that you, your pillow is actually a really big uh, sort of reservoir of dust. Um, the dust really comes from um, like basically human skin and then with dust mites. Um, and, and so, um, uh, you know, using that cover helps it so that the, the pillow stops being a reservoir that you're continually kind of like exposing yourself to um, because that dust can't get into the pillow, the dust can't get out of the pillow. So it keeps it, it's a, it's a very fine uh, cover so that that dust can't come in and out. So you could actually, as you're changing your pillow case, you're, you're, you're able to, to get rid of any dust that's there. Um, you know, also that, you know, um, vacuuming and, and making sure that, that, um, that you're changing um, blankets frequently is another great way to kind of reduce dust exposures. The, um, the using a neti pot and doing a saline or a, a saltwater gargle are also great ways to just sort of clear out the, the pollen. You know, if you've been working in the garden or even just like out on a bike ride or out on a walk and um, come back in, it's a great sort of practice to just sort of like rinse, you know, because uh, because otherwise your body has to do the rinsing and the way your body does the rinsing is by creating mucus. And so, you know, anytime you can help your body by just sort of rinsing off those, those proteins is the, even when people don't have allergies, they can, they can still develop an irritated, you know, sort of reaction, an irritant reaction to the pollen because it's just a big protein that's hanging out in your nasal cavity and, and, uh, you know, and your body will produce some mucus to try to clear it out. So using that, those, those sort of, um, rinsing, uh, um, techniques, you can reduce your, your allergic response quite a bit as well. Um, and some people just kind of do that every, every day before bed. Other people do it, you know, when they come in from outside. Um, I actually found one of the easiest ways to sort of make a neti pot or sinus rinse sort of part of the daily routine is actually to keep it in the shower. Um, and, and that way it's not like, it's easier because it's not like, you're not like trying to, you know, make sure it doesn't get everywhere. It just sort of doesn't matter. And, uh, there, I mean, there's a lot of controversy about whether or not you need to use, um, uh, distilled water and technically, technically the, the, you know, yes. And, and also the reason that we say that even is because there was just a few people who, um, in this one area that got a uh, brain infection from doing, um, sinus rinses. And it was, you know, so meanwhile, you know, people have been using neti pots for so many years and they're, and they're often used in, in areas where they're, uh, isn't as much, you know, even clean water, regular clean water. So, um, so I don't, I personally, I don't get too concerned about it. And I just use tap water, um, because our, the tap water is, you know, tested for bacteria and everything. So, um, so yeah, so that's a good neti pot, uh, sinus rinse. I like, there's the neti pot. that's like a little, looks like a little teapot. I should have brought little, uh, 
you know, demonstration ones, it looks like a little teapot. Um, that's a little bit more technically challenging than the uh, sinus rinse. I'm a big fan of the sinus rinse. That's like the squeeze bottle one um, that you can squeeze and it goes up. Yeah, right. It's like a lot easier. Um, so uh, yeah, I've, I've converted to that one entirely. Um, so in terms of treatment options that we have from a conventional medicine perspective, I just wanted to touch on these just because you know, really, um, actually immunotherapy, I think of as being natural medicine, um, you know, which people might be surprised about because it's like, oh, well, we're talking about shots and, you know, injections and everything. But actually now we're also talking about oral because there's this, the, there's a newer thing just in the last, it's been in Europe for a little while, but now it's here is uh, oral immunotherapy, which means that they, um, they actually send you these little things that you just take orally. And um, instead of having to go, you know, so we're talking about, when we talk about immunotherapy, it's allergy shots, you know, when people go to the allergist and um, get all the, the injections. Um, so the oral immunotherapy is, is, is a lot more accessible for people. I find that a lot of people might be interested in doing immunotherapy, but they can't get into, um, you know, to, to go get a shot every week, you know, uh, is, is quite a lot and also the expense of it and everything else. So um, there is, there's an online program called Get Curex um, that actually allows you to, to do an online visit and then they, they send you the, the oral immunotherapy um, uh, little vials that you just drink every once a week. And, and what, what's happening there is that by, by, by exposing yourself orally to very small amounts of these allergens, the, the body will actually create a tolerance reaction. So it'll actually, it'll, the, the, especially the environmental allergens, it gets tricky with food, food allergies. It's pretty, it's a little bit, we have to think about it a little bit differently, but, um, but, but pretty much by the way that you're, you know, sort of taking it orally, um, your body creates more of a tolerance reaction. Um, and so, so I've seen people who have severe allergies, you know, to, to cats or to mold or to, um, that do immunotherapy and afterwards they have really no significant reaction at all. Um, and what the reason I think about it as natural medicine is because it's not a suppression. We're not suppressing an immune response. We're actually just sort of like retraining it. Uh, so kind of correcting it. Um, and so, so that person can go on for the rest of their life and not have that same kind of reaction. Um, and again, immunotherapy doesn't work for food, for a lot of food intolerances, because that's more of that IgG reaction, which is that other one that we can't quite train in that same way. Um, so, um, uh, and then antihistamines are, um, have been kind of a, a, a hot topic in terms of um, a couple, I think it was a few, two, three years ago, um, some information, or some, some data came out about the fact that things that have an anticholinergic effect, um, have can increase the risk of dementia. And so very specifically diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl, was on like the top of that list because it has a very strong anticholinergic effect. And I'm I'm constantly shocked by the fact that this is still something that is like being used widely and, and is marketed as a sleep aid. So a lot of the sleep aids that are out there, the like, you know, um the Tylenol PM, those kinds of things. I'm not sure about Tylenol PM specifically, but both, a lot of them have this diphenhydramine in them. Um, meanwhile, even, even for kids, I've had some kids that have come in that, that were having trouble sleeping and that are prescribed nightly Benadryl. And I'm like, oh, oh no, like this isn't good. Um, so even in a, in a short term sense, what I see clinically is that it can be a depressant. So I see people who, uh, you know, are using the, these sleep aids and they're, they're feeling quite depressed, but, and also sort of re remarking on cognitive changes. And I've noticed that for a lot of years before, um, uh, before it kind of came out that these were a risk factor for dementia that they because of this anticholinergic activity and it's like oh that totally makes sense actually one of my favorite ever uh cases that was like the best easiest to crack one was that someone came in just like exhausted and feeling depressed and all the things and and um she was like like literally i am falling asleep driving and you know going to work and being at work and then we went through her meds and she was like, she turned out she was taking Benadryl every morning. And I was like, oh good, we, we know exactly what to do. <laughs> um, but of course we all know Benadryl in the morning can cause that, but, but even Benadryl at night actually can have this sort of like lasting effect for the next day. And you know, nobody's done this study, but I'm, but I'm pretty sure just looking at it clinically um, and having seen people you know, um, with Benadryl that, that we could probably do a study and show that it's, uh, that it causes cognitive um, changes. Maybe somebody's done that study. I just haven't found it yet. Um, but uh, so, so anyway, 
I don't recommend regular use of Benadryl. However, if somebody's having like the beginnings of an anaphylactic reaction, like absolutely Benadryl, if, if you don't have an EpiPen, Benadryl is the way to go. Like, so it's a really, it's a powerful medication. Like, you know, it is something not, you know, kind of everything has its time and place, right? Um, so the ones that, that are really the best um, in terms of not having that anticholinergic effect and not having a lot of, of huge side effect profile are the loratadine, which is claritin, cetirizine, the Zyrtec, and fexofenadine, which is Allegra. Um, and those are not on the list of ones that increase the risk of dementia. Um, definitely, again, time and a place, like I actually really, I, I often recommend those. Um, you know, and the other thing to know about those is that um, often they sort of lose effectiveness over time. So, so I find that people often have to rotate between them. So, you know, uh, people will like loratadine will work really well. And then all of a sudden the next allergy season, they are having bad allergies in it. And a lot of times just rotating into a different one. Um, that being said, I, you know, a lot of people, if they're willing to take the, um, the, the complex that has the nettles and the bromelain and the um, NAC and the quercetin, that, that, that works just as well as any of these allergy medicines. And the reason I, that there's a slight benefit to, to doing something, like if we're just taking pills, you know, of course we're doing the food, food version. There's so many other benefits, right? Cause you're getting blueberries, which are also doing all these other, and giving you all these other benefits. Um, but if we're, we're talking about trading pills for pills, there is a difference between using that, that formula with the nettles and the, and the quercetin partially because, so, so in terms of like where we are in the pathway, so so those the, that formula that I use actually stabilizes those mast cells. It decreases the histamine levels. Um, it, nettles have a slight blocking of the histamine receptor effect, but not a whole lot, um, not as much as the as the other ones. Whereas when you take a medication, all it's doing is blocking this one histamine receptor, which is where we get a lot of people who feel really tired, even though they're not having overt allergy symptoms. So they're taking an antihistamine, but what you know, so it's, so it's blocking this histamine receptor, which makes them not have the itchy eyes and the runny nose and the scratchy throat. At the same time, it is not blocking all the other pro-inflammatory uh, enzymes that are out there and that are cruising around and causing causing people to feel you know tired and you know maybe a little more achy or um, just kind of a generally not great feeling. So so that's why you know using those the ones that sort of block it higher up on the pathway and sort of prevent the whole response from happening, um, have a little slightly different effect than the um, um, than the, the ones down here. The other thing actually is, is when we think about histamines and, and all of these, these pro-inflammatory cytokines, they do have effects on, on skin as well, breaking down collagen and everything. So, um, so that's the other kind of thing we think about when we push it up the pathway a little bit. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much all I had on my my uh, list to talk about. Um, the um, anybody anybody have anything to add or any questions or? Go ahead. Question: um, Can I get nettles for tea at Big Y? Big Y, I think I don't think they have it there. Um, I don't I think I've seen it. Yeah, I know at, at Fiddleheads they have they have two forms. They have the nettle tea bag, but they also have just the dried nettles that you can um, uh, that you know you can just get a bunch of them and there and and then you you can put them in those little tea balls or in the tea bags. Yeah. Um, the um, yeah, I've not seen them at Big Y. I, I'm trying to I'm going through the tea section. <laughs> I don't think I've seen the because um, they don't have that. Um, Celebration Herbals brand, and that's that's the one that does have the simple nettles, where it's just only nettles. Um, and and you can also get um, Rose Mountain Herbs is a great source for for dried dried herbs of all types. Um, so if you ever feel inspired to make teas or like you know make salves or any of those things, that's a great great source. And you can get you can get a a big thing of nettles uh, for very I think it's like ten dollars for. A, for a large bag of them. Um, so it's really, they're pretty affordable. They're, you know, it's funny because where I have lived in the past, you know, it's really, it's springtime is very easy to go find nettles and, and harvest them. And I've heard someone talk about there being nettles nearby, but I've yet to find them. Um, so they tend to be kind of in um, like fields and places where like there's not, things have been cleared out. Oh yeah, I think I have some, but you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're tricky to harvest because you get stung by them, you know? So, so yeah, some people are like, I'll circumvent that. Because also too, you can actually take those nettles and you can, I, you know, cook them up. Um, so cook them up just like greens, any greens. And that's, that's another great way to get in a bunch of nettles. Um, and then, 
the, the other things I didn't mention was like, you know, so you can do the tea, the nettle tea, but also you can take those dried nettles and I, I throw them into everything. So like, you know, if I'm making a pesto, throw a bunch of nettles in there. If I'm, you know, cooking a soup, just like take a little dried nettles and throw it in there. It gives it like, an, it's like an herby flavor, but it also, I know it's adding extra nutrients and all the wonderful things that the nettles have, or even in smoothies. Um, so yeah, you can kind of throw them in, you know, tea is kind of the way that, that sort of traditionally we did, you know, herbalists talk about nettle tea all the time. Um, that's just kind of how it's often done, to, you know, medicinally, but, but nettles can kind of be food too. I'm sure Herbwise has it, and then possibly um, Herbwise definitely the ditty bag. Hmm? Herbwise, def Herbwise has nettles, I because that's where I buy mine. So oh, okay, close to Herbwise and Westerly, yeah, because that's where I get it. Okay, I'm thinking the ditty bag might too, because they're doing a uh, you know a fiddleheads type thing with you know lots of bins of, and you get you bring your own container and fill it. Oh, where's the ditty bag? Where's that? Right across from the train station in Mystic. Real the ditty bag, huh? Ditty bag, yeah. It's um they used to make bags out of old sails, so it's all about recycling and saving the environment. They've got everything for that. Oh, I'll have to check that out. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> I think it over there too. It does. It sounds amazing. Like sounds wonderful. I love the good bulk section and like and really, you know, that idea of just being like, if you have people shopping there and not getting packages and containers and everything else, like what an amazing impact that can have, even just with that, you know, I know. people shopping there. It's really like um, the old days, just like the old days, right? <laughs> Yeah. Don't, even just like you think about how everybody got used to bringing their their reusable shopping bags to to go shopping and it's like so you know we can do it like people can do it you know get used to bringing their little containers to, right. them to this grocery store too it's like yep it's a little yeah. bit of retraining they even have containers if you need them oh, you know like true. like people bring in there's a free zone mm -hmm. and you can get a container off a shelf nice. and then you know you weigh that and then you weigh it after you fill it. Oh, oh that's awesome. I got it. I've been planning to get over there. Is it in the same place where that the natural food store used to be in Mystic? In that no, no, no. This is right across the street from the train station. There's several little shops. There's a hairdresser on the end. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. What did it used to be years ago? Pick and pay, but that's before you were born, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there's a couple little stores in there. It's and like they're a, one of them. Um, isn't there like a, a juvenile consignment store there for kids or something? Uh, yeah, that's down a ways, more across from the mill, I think. Mm -hmm. The uh, Roosevelt, whatever they call it now. Yeah. But uh, the big brick building. <laughs> yeah, where your office used to be, Gwen. You used to be yeah, in there. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right across the street there in that Packer yeah. building. Yep. Yep. That's great. Oh, man, I got to get down there. That's awesome. Yeah. I'm going to have to go on a field trip. <laughs> you know, actually, that that is the thing that I'm working on right now is that I want to make um, like an activity calendar that's going to be where we can have like, you know, walks and, you know, go go for a walk or, or walk and talk or or just a walk or um, or field trips to like a farm or field trips to Diddy Bay. Oh, I love um, it. Right. I love yeah. it. And, and like, I mean, even too, like there's, um, you know, we could go to a grocery store and like talk food at a grocery store and like, you know, different, like how, how to basically tell what kind of bread is the best kind of bread or whatever. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm pretty excited about that. The, the oh, yes, yes. That'll be fun. Trip coming up. <laughs> we'll have to oh, rent yeah. the bus, you know, like really to, for the full experience, we'll rent the bus. <laughs> and we'll get a hippie bus, like a, a VW bus. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Love it. <laughs> like, like Al Guthrie drove in Alice's restaurant. Right, right. <laughs> I love it. I love it. A, a vision, a true vision. <laughs> I love it. Oh, well, wonderful. It is wonderful to start the day with both of you. Thank you so much. I really Likewise. Like well, thank class. you. <laughs> and, and so your, your next uh, class is... Um, six o'clock on tuesday the 12th yep that's right yep and then and then so that'll be the uh oh wait no actually isn't it thursday no wait hold on am i yeah thursday the 12th at six o'clock is the um uh is the first pre-diabetes class 
Um, oh wait, no, I'm sorry, I'm looking at May. Oops, see, <laughs> no wonder. Um, I thought pelvic health was next, but am I wrong about that? Yes, it's pelvic. Yeah. I yeah, think okay. it's pelvic yeah, health. Yeah. Yes. On the 12th. Tuesday. Yep, the Tuesday the 12th. You, you are correct, sorry about that. Um, and so that's the six o'clock. I'm kind of trying lots of different times just to see sort of like what works the best. And I would love any feedback about what you what you all like um, in terms of timing. Um, you know, just like, I know everybody has different schedules. So I was kind of making it bounce around just to just to accommodate different schedules. But um, but yeah, any feedback about that, about, you know, what time of day you, you like having classes? Well, I like mornings, but I, the worker pe working people can't do that. So I, it would be better for me if you could just do a half hour earlier in the evenings, like five o'clock. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Because it otherwise it interferes on the cook. <laughs> yep, yeah, absolutely. Actually, like, and to be totally honest, it actually interferes with, with my routine too. You know, in terms of like, you know, dinner, bedtime, all that. And, and that is, that is the tricky part is kind of like trying to balance the, like the, you know, work, worker, you know, kind of schedule. Um, and, and realistically, I kind of think I should maybe, you know, not be focused on that so much because so many people, it's like, you know, if they're, they're working up until five by the time they get home and get settled and all the things, it's like, they're not really able to watch it live anyway, is what I'm kind of seeing at least. Um, and so, so maybe I need to just you know, bump it back a little bit. So it's like more of that 4.30. And that'd be better for me too. We have in 3, 3.30, 4, 4.30. 4 kind of yes, <laughs> that'd be great. Yep. <laughs> yeah, and I like the mornings too. So, uh, and I think actually a lot of times mornings work well for people, you know, before going to work, um, you know, so so I might even think about doing some like seven o'clock ones or some, you know, eight o'clock ones. And we'll just kind of see what we, what we see there. Yeah, just maybe you should just throw it out there at every class to get a different flavor for like, who you know. Yeah, absolutely. And I was thinking about for people who haven't been able to make it to sort of ask me like, you know, sort of starting to be like, okay, so what time would work for you? So right. um, just as I'm seeing people in the office. Yeah. Questions, because I think um, sometimes I'm surprised by by the answer when, when it comes up. I remember we were doing this, this um, workshop with people and and like what ended up working the best for everybody was like the middle of the day on a Wednesday. And I was like, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, like I wouldn't have seen that coming. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, well, okay, you know, so maybe, so sometimes just asking is actually where we get the most. Um, yeah. Or you could send out an email. Yeah, totally. Like, yeah. An email and just have them do a, like a voting type thing. Oh, yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like block out, even just like they have those ones where you can block out which parts of the schedule you're available and so that you can see where there's crossover and everything. Um, so yeah, I should do that. I always don't, I always get worried about inundating people with, with emails. Um, so, uh, but, uh, but I could put that on one of the, the, the sort of update on the, the calendar update. Yeah. 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 Because then that way, you know, that that way, you know, whoever wants to participate, they'll they'll do their input because maybe sometimes people are shy about saying it mm -hmm. in person and stuff. And, and email is kind of like an incognito way for somebody to voice it and it, put it out there. I don't know. It, it's true. Point. You know, yeah, there's a lot of people who feel more comfortable on email. And also on that same same by that same token, like there's a lot there. I've had feedback from people that they prefer to watch the videos because they, they feel nervous about like, you know, getting on the platform and, you know, all the things about that. And so, um, um, so I say, yeah, okay, great. You know, if that works for, if that's really yeah. what you like to do it, you know, watching the video. But um, then, but then you'd be saying, oh, I should have asked this question. I should have asked this question. And you can't ask the questions. That's the problem. Right, right. That is, that is the, the drawback there. Yep. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> oh, oh, I wanted to ask this. Then you got to write it down and save it. And then like, I'll have to ask for later. I'll have to ask for later. Totally. Or for me, it's also like, I don't pay attention as well, unless I'm like, I'm on, you know, like right. sort of, you know, the, if I'm not on video, I'm like doing something else and I'm like, wait, what just happened? <laughs> like, I don't pay attention as well. Yeah. So. You get distracted. The yep. distraction. Um, yeah. I like the, I prefer the interaction, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but if I, I mean, if I had to watch one, you know, recorded, that wouldn't, it wouldn't be horrible. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's really streaming. That's how we watch everything these right. days. Isn't it? Right. No yeah, absolutely. Right. Yep, it's just kind of the on demand. Yep. Yeah, that's the <laughs> um, way of the world, man. That's where we are. Yep, right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, well, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, and thanks so much for, for being here and for all of your 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 uh, um, 
contributions to uh, to this this seminar here. Um, oh, thank you, Gwen. <laughs> thank you. Have a, joy, have a joyful day. You too. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Bye. bye.